Okay, so we both did a lot of research for our books. Uh, we both had to research the 50s in different parts of the world. Um, so one thing that uh, I wanted to ask you is if there was anything as you were doing your research that surprised you? Yes, I mean, well, the event itself was surprising and upsetting and, and um, very well covered, so it was fascinating to look back through the archives of that. The former rabbi had um, given his, all his correspondence to a, um, a special archive at Emory University, and so to read through like, his original sermons was you know, typewritten with scratch, X's and scratch and all that was really fascinating. But I think for me, what, what I somehow didn't know, one of the very many things I didn't know, um, was the history of um, how, like, why so many private schools in the South seem to start in the late 50s, um, and how um, for, for many families who were afraid of the aftermath of the Brown v. Board, um, Board of Ed decision, you know, pulled their kids out of public schools, in some cases pulled them out of school altogether and waited for these private academies to be built so that they had an option to put their kids in white schools. So that's something that, I, that somehow escaped my notice. Yeah, and, and well, for me doing this research, you know, I read about 1953 in Iran and I, you know, I tried to do my due diligence researching the coup d'etat. I also had the benefit of talking to elders in my family who had lived through it. One thing that surprised me was how many people I interviewed were either taking a nap during the coup <laughs> or hiking or just didn't want to talk about it. Um, yeah, taking a nap. So, but the, the person who helped me the most was my dad, and he just brought to life the Tehran of his youth, of his adolescence. And as I talked to him, one thing that surprised me was how vibrant and almost glamorous and magical it was, obviously not for everybody, but for certain classes. And there was a blossoming publishing scene. There was a blossoming cinema culture, um, theater, music. There was a sense of a bold new beginning under you know the circumstances in which they were living. And it surprised me because I should know better, and I do know better. But we, we get a narrative about Iran as though it began in 1979. There's like a couple thousand years before that. Um, so it was, it was very eye-opening to see this country that was, is often, you know, very opposite to the way it's described in the news today. And those seeds that were glamorous and long were really fun. Those seeds were fun. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there are many themes that echo <laughs> the murdering earthquake. <laughs> like right now, we were listening to the Mueller testimony on the way up. So, so what what do you make of that? That you went into you know writing, kind of steeping yourself in 1953, and here we are, many years later, with asking some of those same questions. Yeah. Part of the reason I said it in 1953 was to get away from myself, haha, -ha, as though you can ever do that when you write, um, because the first book had been semi-autobiographical and it was about the revolution and the war and all that. And I thought, well, here's something that has nothing to do with me in a different time and place. And yet, as I was writing it, so much of what was happening in Iran of 1953, the kind of polarization politically where you had a strong communist movement, you had a strong pro-prime minister movement, and you had a strong pro-Shah movement. And increasingly, these three factions became more and more entrenched in their beliefs and less and less open 
to anyone who wasn't of their faction. And as I was doing the revisions, I, I wrote the first draft a week before the election of 2016, which is a really good thing, because then I sat around for a few months just stunned. And then I did the revisions during 2017. And as I was writing about demonstrations happening in 1953 Tehran, there was the Women's March. You know, it was the march right after the travel ban. So history sadly repeats itself and, and it echoes in various ways. And I know that is true so sadly for your book. I thought it would be interesting to write about a time, you know, that was before my time, and it felt like a safe kind of um, distance to look at some issues of um, race and anti-Semitism, and, um, and then, you know, there's Charlottesville. We have a daughter who lives in, in Charlottesville, and, um, you know, just to hear her talk about, she lives around the corner from the Thomas Jefferson Lawn, you know, where people were marking, marching with their tiki torches saying, um, Jews will not replace us. And then, of course, all these, you know, the, the events in Pittsburgh and in San Diego and in Sri Lanka and in New Zealand. And, um, and for me, it's just, uh, you know, devastating, really, to think how timely something set in 1958 um, still is. Yeah, and it's funny, Susan, because when you first told me the premise of In the Neighborhood of True, I remember thinking, oh, wow, that's crazy. That would never happen today. And then as you wrote the draft... Because I'm slow, and Mark and I are both very slow. We are. It took um, many years. Yeah. Enough time passed for it to come back in vogue, sadly. So, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting how that happens. Um... Okay, so I guess our last question for the two of us. Um, we talked, well, both our books cover first love, and both our books explore that intensity and emotional sort of velocity of a first love. And yet, in both of our books, that first love goes awry due to conflict, societal issues, and basically politics too. So what were some of your thoughts as you were drafting this and revising it and seeing how first love went for Ruth? In my book, my character falls for this sort of southern boy who um, has many charms and, um, and she's, she's all in until this crime just starts to unravel in her a little bit and, and has her asking questions. And ultimately, she has to ask herself whether she can be with someone who she has not, who doesn't really know her because she hasn't said that she's Jewish, and wh whom she doesn't really perhaps know so well. And Marjan's daughter, who is sort of in my target um, age, <laughs> maybe a tiny bit older, She's a, she just finished her freshman year at Tufts, came up to me and said, like, how come they don't end up together? <laughs> I'm like, they can absolutely not be together in the she end. She was very but, uh, embarrassed she was... by that question, FYI. She later told me, I must have sounded really dumb. No, no, no. Because they're not supposed sound... to be together. <laughs> no, 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 she didn't sound dumb, but I, I, I thought it was like, I thought it was, it spoke well of the novel that she wanted them to be together, because they clearly, without these, um, with so much secrecy and political hate and violence between them, they couldn't be together. But still, that first love is so, um, the, the pull of it is so powerful that you want it to sort of overcome everything, um, even if it cannot. And how about for you? Yeah, the pull of first love. You know, I did a lot of research also about first love while writing this book, and apparently, well, by definition, first love happens for people when they're quite young, right, usually. And apparently, there's like almost a biological imprint on your brain. I, let a, I read a lot of AARP articles. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's so. About, yeah. yeah, retired people or widows and widowers reuniting with their first loves. There's like a 
like, almost like an imprint on your brain about that one person. So in this book, when they fall in love, and they fall in love pretty crazily in a whirlwind courtship, um, they are separated not just by political events, so it's not just the coup. I don't want to get into spoilers, but there's also issues of class and uh, machinations, family duties, yeah, trust, and what we could call fate. And um, I wanted to show that that's kind of how life works. You know, it's really nice in Hollywood movies when everything works out, but and most lives are a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and one thing that's been really crazy is now that the book is out, I've been getting emails from people. Some of them are quite personal. And they talk to me about their reactions to this book. And some of them, you know, I just sit on my laptop trying not to sob because they'll, they'll say, well, because of this, I'm now going to contact JP. Or um, I've been now writing some letters, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think first love lost is an interesting theme, but what I wanted to do with this book, which you can't necessarily do in real life, is to have a healing, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean people get back together, but there can be a healing and an understanding, and I think that's why we write fiction, right? <laughs> For the reader. <laughs> well, you can at least get to certain things, yeah. So, yeah. So we can open it up if any of you have any questions for us about anything. Our novels or writing or... Here, I don't know. <laughs> I studied management because it was considered not realistic or acceptable to be an artist. Um, you in know. your family, you should add. Yeah, yeah, in my family and my community. When, when you're the child of immigrants, there is a lot of pressure. And even when you're not the child of like fresh immigrants, there is a lot of pressure to make a living, <laughs> have stability, financial stability. I always wanted to be a writer, but I felt that it wasn't something I could pursue full time. My parents always said, how about it can be your hobby? You know, kind of like knitting. <laughs> so um, I was pre-med for a little tiny bit. I applied to law school. I ended up with the MBA. Um, I went to a very sort of competitive macho business school. I went to Columbia Business School. I ended up having babies and not using it in business, which I don't know, maybe that was a subconscious out. But um, I ended up teaching business writing, which is how I actually met Susan. Briefly, we both did So that. I did teach business writing, which was one way of marrying the two conflicting backgrounds. Um, sometimes people... There is spreadsheets in my first novel. There is, so there's that. <laughs> um, sometimes people ask if I, you know, use my MBA skills to like market my books now. Not really. The only thing that I could say the MBA gave me that I carry to this day, like I've forgotten a lot of the finance and accounting and all that, but what it showed me was to have a thick skin. Because those people I was with and my cluster of 60, there were 50 males, 10 females, they showed me how to have a thick skin, which a lot of my fellow artists don't have as much, but boy, did I learn that in the MBA, because I'm sure you know it's pretty, you know, no one holds back, and you can. Probably, yeah, probably, that's probably why I retreated at that <laughs> point. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if you've traveled to Iran before or if you plan to, if you still have family there, and how that has or hasn't influenced your work. So I left when I was about 10, almost 11, and I didn't go back for 
15 years. I went back when I was 25, and then I went back three times over the years. I did use it for a lot of my research for Together T, my first novel. When that book came out, I haven't been since. Um, sometimes you worry going back, especially as a dual national, because we're targeted, honestly, the most. When you hear about Americans being held in Iranian prisons, they're often of Iranian descent. They're Iranian Americans. So I haven't been back since, but as my aunt told me, I don't know what you're worried about. No one cares about you. So I was like, <laughs> okay, thank you. But, you know, like I'm not important enough to be arrested. But, um, yeah, going back those times was always amazing. And it's never like what you see on the news, ever. I did, I did a lot of writing and then sort of saw holes and then did research to fill holes. Um, and as I filled holes, you know, new threads would emerge, so i do some more writing. So I did it in probably a very inefficient way. Um, but it's, for me, it starts with the writing and the, and the research comes second. Yeah, you know, you hear so many writers, especially historical fiction writers, say they love the research, they can't stop researching, it's hard to get to the writing, but I don't think we're like that. No, for us, I think in, in the fact, opposite. being first, yeah. Yeah, I really wanted to get the research over with, because I'm not that much into the research, but of course I had to do my duty, um, so I did, but I was excited to get to the story. I was too. I think, too, for both of us, we've used real events as a jumping off point for a fictional story. So we didn't have the responsibility of mm -hmm. capturing a real person and, and um, yeah. So there are no real people, like other than, you know, like of course, the leaders of a country or, you know, political actual figures. The characters are all fictional. But I think I did research first, like just so I knew what the heck was going on then I quickly dived into the story. Then I adjusted it as I learned more. And I don't know if, if this was true for you, Susan, but it surprised me how fact-checked I was. I mean, Simon & Schuster got down to the nitty-gritty. I was so proud I had the names of like certain streets, and then the fact-checker would come back and say, well, was it, it wasn't Avenue. You wrote Avenue. It was Street. It was Hafez Street. I was like, oh, wow. Like, the fact that I even knew the name. <laughs> um, but they really checked it. Maybe something not to that same degree, but yes. For me, it, was, it came up sometimes with um, my character does a lot of wordplay, and, um, and some of those were, you know, not in use until 1962 or something, so I needed to, to find some different... Uh, We definitely met on purpose, yes. Definitely met so that we wouldn't give up. Mm -hmm. um, that was definitely there why was we met. There was a cheerleading aspect, for sure. Yes. I don't write every day. I just don't know how anyone with a family does do that. Maybe if you have a wife, which I don't. So, I don't know. I don't write every day. No, I don't write every day, but I write... Many days, I guess I would say. And sometimes not a lot, but I noodle around. Any other questions? Um, I would say the best way to describe it is it's a city of contradictions. It's got uh, 
a lot of rules and regulations that are imposed by the government about how people should dress, how they should behave, how they should interact, and then there's constant pushback and defiance, constant, especially by the women. The other way I would say it's not like you see on the news is um, the news tends to show the most glaring kind of news bitey scenes, you know, like, oh, people are burning the American flag, but they don't show all the young people downloading American movies, listening to American music, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think when the first time I took my daughter, she put it best, she said, when the first morning we walked around Tehran, she said, oh, I thought it would be in black and white, but it's actually in color. And it's a very colorful city with a lot of texture and, you know, contradictions. It's not at all this broad brush that you see in the news. One, one other question. I promise this will be the last one from me. Um, the business of writing. Uh, I'm curious, you know, um, since uh, Marjan, you had said that uh, traditionally writing was viewed, in your family at least, as not a real profession. Uh, go do something realistic. Um, I'm wondering what advice you would give to uh, aspiring writers today who, you know, have so many opportunities to write, whether it's blogs or uh, you name it. Uh, there are so many uh, outlets and, and uh, genres to write in. I'm wondering uh, sort of how you were able to uh, write your first novel and sort of, uh, you know, be taken seriously as a writer. So what happened with my first novel is I started it when I was getting the MFA at the same time as getting the MBA. And then I had kids and I stopped writing for six years. And it wasn't until my youngest child went to full-time school that I went back to it. The trick is to not stop, because when I think of my MFA cohorts, the ones who are published now with books out and the ones who are not, it's not necessarily the more talented ones who have books out, it's the ones who didn't give up. So I would say throw away the clock. You know, I have students now, young, who are like, oh, I'm gonna finish this novel. I, my goal is to finish by the end of 2019. I'm like, hmm, yeah. So most first novels take 10 years. So my advice would be to throw away the clock, do it in tandem with the rest of your life. Don't give up your day job, please. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, if you did, keep, keep writing, keep going. Um, when we were meeting at the library, I think there were days when we looked at each other, and this, this was not our first books. We, we, we would just say, what, what do we, what, is this ever gonna see the light of day? So it's kind of cool that we're here. Would you think? I, I teach um, college students who are always like, by the time I graduate, by the time I'm 25, you know, there are all these sort of arbitrary goals, but it's all about like making art that pleases you. And then, and then there's time to worry about whether it'll find an audience and the business of um, writing, but. Yeah, and I would say focusing on the habits that you have daily or weekly rather than the result. Because the doing of it, if you keep doing it, things will happen, but you can't think about, well, what will eventually happen, you know? And the pleasure is really in the process. I know that's a cliche, but it's the actual truth. Thanks all for coming. Don't forget to, um, there's books for sale over there that these guys will sign, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.